can never see my notes. Is this on? Hey, good evening. Welcome. I think we're going to get started here. Um, it's so glad, so glad to see some faces here, a few faces here in person, our first time back here, I think in person in a few months. Is that correct? So good evening. My name is Brian DeBona. I'm the executive director of the Friends of MCC Foundation. Um, I just want to do a couple reminders. Number one is that we record all these sessions. Uh, we're going to be recording tonight's session, so you can go back and watch it. We have those at www.mchenry.edu forward slash experts. Uh, at the end of tonight's session, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. And I just would want to throw out a thank you to uh, MCC for um, hosting this event and to the Friends of MCC Foundation for pro providing financial support uh, for programs like this. In addition to raising money for scholarships, uh, the foundation also raises money to support uh, college programs, and there couldn't be a better one than this, our Expert and Insight series. So with that, I'm going to introduce our topic, and I have to be frankly honest, it's a topic I know absolutely nothing about. So uh, the topic is, is it hot in here or is that just me? Menopause, myths versus facts, tips and tricks. Uh, our speakers are going to discuss the many aspects of menopause, dispel common beliefs about this experience, and share wellness tips from a psychological and biological standpoint. I'm excited. <laughs> but the greatest thing is I get to introduce three of my favorite per people at the college. And I say that every time I introduce our faculty because, honestly, every single person here is some of my favorite people at the college. So uh, we have Dr. Christine Grella, our MCC instructor of psychology. We have Kristen Lauderman, an instructor in our MCC physical therapist assistant program. And we have Elaine Whalen, our instructor and department chair of health and fitness education. With that, I'm going to hand it over. So welcome, thank you all for coming. Um, as you just heard, I'm Christine Grell, I teach psychology here at MCC, um, and I teach both human sexuality and lifespan development, um, and so I think those connect kind of obviously um, to the topic of menopause. Do you guys wanna introduce yourselves, or you wanna wait? Okay, all right, um, so I, just me for now. Um, so I get to start us off, and I wanna start us off by showing you this. Um, so you can certainly ask questions at the end of our presentation, but if you have questions during our presentation, you can pull out your device and send a text to this number, and your text message, message should say that, so at meno off, and then you'll be able to text in questions. Um, or you can go to this website. It, asks, it might ask you for your name or something. You don't have to put your full name. You can just put a smiley face or an initial or whatever it is, um, but hopefully that will work, and you can send in questions, and I'll get them on my phone, and we'll look at those. Okay, so um, to get us started, what is menopause? So we talk a lot about menopause, but we want to clarify the actual definition. So menopause is the time that marks the end of your menstrual cycles. So when you're in the process of kind of spacing out your menstrual cycles, um, that's not menopause. That's the perimenopausal period. And menopause actually marks the point where you've missed a menstrual cycle for 12 months total. Um, so men menopause is like the end of all the transition stuff that we've been talking about, or that we will be talking about. Um, menopause happens typically in the 40s and 50s, um, but the average age is 51. So again, that's the average age for cessation of menstrual cycles 12 for a full 12 months. Um, there is a process to this, of course, though. Um, so menopause is a biological process, and there are physical symptoms, such as hot flashes, emotional sim symptoms, that can affect your sleep, lower your energy, and affect emotional health. There are lots of treatments, we'll be talking about many of those tonight, um, but there are also lifestyle adjustments that you can make, or um, in more severe cases, something like hormone therapy. So we just wanted to kind of clarify exactly what it is that we're talking about. Um, I wanna talk about kind of our perspectives about menopause. So most of us, when we think about menopause, we're not like, woo, I can't wait. Um, maybe it will be nice to end your periods, but the rest of it were like, oh no, I've heard such horrible things about this. I'm gonna wake up in the middle of the night. I'm gonna be irritable. I, all these horrible things are gonna happen to me. Um, and when you look at these kind of websites, that's the message that we get. 
Um, so I just Googled a couple of websites um, and look, the emotional roller coaster of menopause. We're all in for it. Um, or this one, this is actually the National Institutes of Aging website. So here you've got understanding the menopausal transition and what is menopause, that doesn't sound bad. But then they focus on Larissa's story. So she's 52 and excited to be starting a new phase of her life, but recent health changes have been getting in the way of her goals. She's having hot flashes and trouble sleeping. She's waking up several times a night and now she's irritable and fed up with the hot flashes. Like life is gonna be difficult during this transition. But when you actually look at the literature, it's only about 20% of women who are actually ir irritated by the irritation. Um, so only about 20% of women actually experience problematic symptoms of menopause. So things are happening to us biologically, but we're not upset by it most of the time. Um, but all of the literature, when you look at these kind of websites, they're like, oh, 20% of women are gonna experience this. And yeah, it might be 20% of women, but that means 80% aren't. Um, and they never put it that way, or they never say only 20% of women experience this. It's always like, ooh, 20%. And yeah, that's a lot of women, if you think about all the women, but it's still not the majority. It's not even half, right? So we will be experiencing changes. We're gonna be talking about that. Um, but in terms of this being this problematic time of our lives that we really need to worry about, the data just isn't there. Um, so psychology is very much interested in this. Um, so we know that our beliefs and our expectations about things actually affect our biology. So there's this mind-body connection. And this is one of the th things that interests me the most about this topic, is that if we believe this literature, and we expect it to be horrible, it will be. Um, so if you have these fears and these expectations that it's going to be this terrible time of life, the research says you'll fulfill that prophecy and it will be more difficult for you than if you accept that it's this kind of natural stage that we all go through. And if you actually focus on the, the good things that come with aging, um, so we gain a lot more confidence, we gain more um, emotional regulation, uh, self-control, um, the ability to better discern others' motives. Good things happen to us as we get older, and we tend to focus on the bad things. Um, and that actually makes aging worse and makes menopause specifically worse. If we can focus on the better parts, it will actually be a better transition for us. Um, while we were doing this project, I think it was Kristen who told me about this, so I wasn't aware. Um, but the women in this image are roughly the same age as the women in this, this image. In fact, Sarah Jessica Parker, if you know who she is, the one in the middle, is 57 years old, I think this, this week. Um, and sure, they're Hollywood stars, there's makeup, there's costumes, obviously. But that's really interesting. Like when we think about menopause, this is what we think of, right? We think of the golden girls. That's what old women look like. We don't look at these women and be like, oh, they must be postmenopausal. Like that's not what you would think of. Um, but you can be, you can be vibrant and sexy in the city even after <laughs> menopause. Um, so again, my point is that the messages we tend to receive from media send us down this trajectory that actually makes it worse for us. Oops, I skipped one, okay. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about partners. Um, so our partners love us and care for us and want to help us um, and they want to give us support and so they hear these same messages and then when we say something like, oh, we're having trouble sleeping or was that a hot flash or is that just me? Um, they want to help, right? Like our partners want to be there for us. But the problem is, is they absorb all those medical messages as well. So they're like, oh, well, there's something wrong with you. You're going through menopause. You need to go see a doctor and get some treatment for that. Um, and that is not necessarily the most helpful message. Um, so the research actually says that women consider that um, problematic because it's affirming that expectation that there is in fact something wrong with you, that you need an intervention um, that you need help and you can't deal with this in kind of, again, that natural transition kind of way. Um, so an intervention from a partner is considered more positive when it's more accepting of the, the change. 
So soothing the symptoms, accepting lifestyle changes, as opposed to really focusing on, well, maybe you should see a doctor about that. A doctor can fix that problem, whatever the problem is, right? Um, so recent research shows that partners want to help, but they don't really know what to do other than send you somewhere else. Um, and women themselves often feel isolated because we don't talk very much about this transition. Um, it's not even a conversation that I've had in detail with my mother, and like if anyone's gonna talk to you about menopause, it seems like it should be your mother. Um, so we just need more education, specifically on what we can do kind of naturally to accept the transition and make it the best that we can do. And that's where Elaine and Kristen come in. So here's the... So I'm Dr. Kristen Lauterman, and I teach in the PTA program, the Physical Therapist Assistant Program. But along with teaching, I also treat patients every week. And my specialty is women's health. Kind of perfect for today, I think. Um, so really what I wanted to do when I started today was go back to what Christine said. We wanted to make it really challenging with Kristen and Christine today. So there's a quiz later. Um, but what is menopause? Yes, we know it's the cessation of the menstruation for 12 months, but why does that happen? Well, primarily it happens because our bodies stop producing some of the hormones that we have relied on since puberty. And the two main hormones are gonna be estrogen and progesterone. And so those hormones start to drop. And they don't just drop at once, they don't just crash. They kind of go through the same roller coaster that we had in puberty when things were kind of a little bit new and different, and this is new and different. It's just going the opposite direction. So some of the symptoms that women can feel or have, and like Christine said, it's only 20%. They might be irregular periods. Well, that's kind of the definition of it, isn't it? And then we have hot flashes. But everybody has hot flashes to some degree, because the hot flashes actually happen, generally speaking, because of vasodilation, the changes in our blood vessel sizes. They get bigger, they come to the surface, we get hot. They get smaller, they go away, we get cold. That's why sometimes you get cold after eating, right? Because all of your blood's going to your stomach. So your body is doing this your whole life. It just gets a little dysregulated, a little bit more at this point in time for some people. And then you have chills, because I just, said why, right? And then you have night sweats because then that happens while you're sleeping. And then you didn't sleep very well because you were hot and then you were cold and now you're cranky because you didn't sleep. So all of these things can be due to some really small changes or you have none of them at all. And a lot of people have none of them and the only way they know that they're in perimenopause or menopause is they don't have a period. I mean, that's, I'm not gonna lie, that's a, that's a bonus. So kind of focusing on those is hard, but what we know is happening without question, every single woman as they go into menopause, because of the drop in estrogen, is losing bone mass. Now I'm gonna get a little biologically with you, but that's not a word, biological with you. You have three types of cells within your bones, and bones, unlike hair, is alive. And it's a living, growing, creature and it can heal itself if you fracture it. So it's, it's always regenerating and growing. But those three cells, one is the, the cell that makes bone. And that is, is working up until the day that we pass away. So that one's always there. The second one is the bone that's, or the cell that's just maintaining the bone. And so it's got the bone, it's just gonna hold on to it. And the third cell is the one that removes bone. And so our body is constantly saying, make more, take some away. Make more, take some away. And the problem when we get into menopause is estrogen dampens that cell that takes the bone away, that gets rid of bone. So in the very beginning, in the first four to eight years of menopause, those cells have nothing slowing them down and they just go crazy. And they're taking away bone faster than the one can lay it down. And so we start to lose bone mass. Now there's things that we can do to undo that, but that's a guarantee across the board. So when you have just a little bit of bone loss and that mineral in your bone goes away a little bit, we call that osteopenia, just a little bit. If it gets to the point that you're at an increased risk for fractures, then that becomes osteoporosis. 
And this website here, FRAX, which is the Fra Fracture Risk Assessment Tool, you can go to that. It's an international tool that's translated into many, many languages for men and for women. This is not just a postmenopausal tool. But you put in your lifestyle, your medications, your family history, all of the information about you, and it gives you a risk factor for your chances of having a fracture. And then it's something that you can talk to your doctor about. Do we need to change our lifestyle? Do we need to have some medications? What do we need to do to decrease that overall risk? So the other thing, and this is where it gets a little wishy-washy in the research, is that estrogen does help our heart to stay healthy. So when we lose that estrogen, it can look like we have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But the problem with that is we don't know if that has to do strictly with estrogen loss or if it has to do with lifestyle, because as we know, I'm not the same person I was when I was a teenager, right? I, I'm not bouncing around like that anymore. I get a little more tired now and want to sit down and rest after my long days of teaching. But is it, so is it lifestyle? Is it other risk factors like cholesterol or other diseases that may have come into play? We don't know, but we do know there is some correlation between estrogen and cardiovascular disease. But again, we can change our life and make various strategic changes to decrease those risks. And some of what we can do, and Elena's going to get into more of these in detail, but we can just do activity. And this is a great um, review here where they looked at 43 different studies. So it's not just one study. So when we look at a systematic review or a meta-analysis, we're taking a bunch of studies together and we're putting all their data and looking at really big pictures. So this looked at 4,300 women who were postmenopausal, And what they found is just doing activity was good. Some were definitely better than others. But across the board, being more active helped decrease all of these risks. So now let's talk about my favorite topic. So again, women's health, I, I love to talk about incontinence, pee, poop, and sex. And I get to talk about two of those today, so I'm pretty excited. All right, so with that estrogen, and you know, one of those things that happens is as we get older, we tend to maybe get a few more of those lovely lines on our faces and a little more wrinkles and I buy those expensive creams because it's going to help me to look plump and young and fresh. Well, it's estrogen. Again, estrogen. And it helps to maintain the collagen and elastin fibers in our skin. And well, our vagina is skin. It's the same skin, just in a different place. So when we lose that estrogen, we lose that plumpness and that, that elasticity that we once had, the vaginal canal itself can, can, can become dry and a little irritated making intercourse less comfortable. So we have some easy ways to try to improve that. You can use lubrication. And lubrication is just used at the time of intercourse. So use it when you need it kind of thing. Or you can go to a vaginal moisturizer that you use every couple days. It's like literally like lotion just inserted into your vagina. The body then absorbs it and can use it to help keep those tissues nice and plump. Now, depending on the lubrication you use, it can help do those as well. Um, so if you're going to be purchasing lubrication for intercourse, you want to make sure that it's a water-based one so that your body can absorb it and it uses it much like that, that moisturizer and not uh, silicone-based that's going to sit on top and potentially irritate those tissues. You also want to steer clear of things that say tingling or exciting because that's generally done with capsaicin, which is chili pepper, right? That just, it tingles because it's literally hot. Um, and so if you're having irritation, not the way we want to go. We want to go all natural. Um, you can use various natural oils. However, we want to be very safe. Those can interact with uh, condoms and not prevent against sexually transmitted infections. So do be careful with those. You can go as far as to do hormone replacement. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a little bit. And it, it's a very valid and, and good tool if necessary. But I would recommend trying some of the other ones first. And then the last one, pacing. What is pacing? This is not like how you don't get pregnant. That's a different type of pacing. Uh, this pacing is thinking of the differences between men and women. And yes, I'm just using a heterosexual couple for this uh, example here. But men, when they're ready, they're ready. 
They're like a light switch. You turn it on and it's ready to go. It's lit up. Women are not light switches. We're ovens. We need a preheat cycle. You gotta warm it all up in order for it to go. I don't care how young and vibrant you are, without that good preheat, it could be irritating and uncomfortable. Now the other thing that I wanna talk about with, with sex is it is considered, and again, I bill my treatments all the time, right? You know, I, I don't work for free. And when I bill, Medicare and all insurance companies pay if you cannot have comfortable sex. It's covered by your insurance because it's considered an activity of daily living. Don't have to do it daily, but you could. And if it's something that's, they pay for so few things that are just strictly painful. Like, yeah, your shoulder hurts, your back hurts. Well, you have to have something else going on for them to want to pay for that, but not sex. That's how important this has to be to have a fulfilled life. So if, if Medicare can pay for it, I mean, it must be important, right? I think so. Okay, my second favorite topic is incontinence. I, I really have no idea. I think my mom did something wrong when she was raising me to have these be my favorite topics. Uh, but when we lose that estrogen and we lose that plumpness and we lose that elasticity, it can also affect our ability to control our urine. Now, one of the things I hear my patients say all the time is, well, I, I don't pee any more than normal. What's normal? If you're potty trained, that should be never, right? So past the age of four, we should not be relying on external ads. Man, the ads are just getting crazy nowadays. It, it breaks my heart every time they come on TV. Um, you know, now you can get them that look all lacy and pretty, and I, that's not the way we want to do it. But incontinence happens a, a lot of different reasons. Um, big babies, postmenopausal, all those things are, are very common things I hear women say, but realistically, they should never happen. But to kind of help figure out if you are in this boat where you might be, we have a bunch of types, but I'm going to highlight three of them right here. The first one is, what did I put up there first? Stress incontinence. So that's my funny sign here, right? I laugh so hard the tears run down my legs. That's if you laugh, if you sneeze, if you cough, if you lift, if you slip, if, if something happens and you have that pressure, and that's just a little too much. And it has now overdone what the bladder can handle. The next one is urge incontinence. That's when you've got to go and you have to go right now. And I know my mom is going to watch this video later, so she's going to be so mad at me. But it's the pee pee walk. My mom perfected it, right? Or the cross leg walk. Oh, I'm sorry, mom. I do love you. Um, but that's, it. that's urge incontinence. Because if I told you you had to stop and you couldn't move, well, even if you never had a leak, it's probably going to happen then, right? And the other one of urge incontinence that people don't realize is if you go to the bathroom more than seven times in 24 hours, yes, middle of the night counts, then that's considered urge incontinence as well. So if you're going every half an hour because you had your morning coffee, it's not your morning coffee because it should be, your bladder should be able to hold between two and four hours between voids. So if those things are a problem, or maybe you have a little bit of both. So you have mixed incontinence, a little bit of urge and a little bit of got to go. Those are all things that we can work on. And we can do that through seeing a women's health physical therapy like me, um, or seeing talking to your physician about some other alternatives. But take home message for this is it's never OK. Not even a little bit is OK. So let's try some pelvic floor exercises together. I can't be a physical therapist and let everybody just sit there doing nothing, because the first word of my job is physical. So OK, if we're going to do a Kegel or a pelvic floor contraction, what you want to do is try to lift up on the pelvic floor or the perineum. And that's the space between your sit bones. So everybody kind of just, in your mind, feel your sit bones. And think about that space that's between those two bones. Now, imagine you're not here on these nice plushy chairs, but you're in church, and it's really quiet. And you're on a hard wooden pew, so there's no cushion to absorb a sound. And you have to toot. But you don't want anyone to know. So you can't do this, because that's not a Kegel. You can't squeeze your butt cheeks, because that's not a Kegel. And then somebody's going to know. 
So what you have to do is lift up towards your head of that space between your two sit bones, but so no one else can see you do it. Because on the outside, we shouldn't see anything. Right? So you just lift it up, but you don't want to stay there for too long. Lift, lower back down. It, it's, it's not your quads, right? It's not meant to carry you around all day. It's just meant to lift and to relax. Lift and relax. And doing it a couple times and getting that awareness. Because unlike your arm or your leg, if you're weak there, I can look down and say, bend my elbow and straighten my elbow. And I can see if I'm doing it. I can't see this. So you have to rely on that sensation. So practicing it and getting your brain to talk to your pelvic floor is the first thing we have to do. And then we can work on other things down the road. But that's step one for performing. So if you all did it with me, I couldn't tell. Good job. Um, but you did some Kegels. Okay, so now let's talk about some hormones. If those symptoms are bad enough, they're at the point where, you know, you can't take off any more clothes and your hot flashes are ruining your day, and they're really just taking over your life, then we can look at doing some hormone replacements. Now, there are other medications that you can talk to your physician about that aren't hormone replacements that can help with some of the hot flashes and sleep and those side of things. So if it's something that you have decided with your physician that needs to go this route, we have a couple different ways that we can address it. So if you are fully intact, if you have your uterus and your ovaries, then you can have hormone replacement that is both estrogen and progesterone, much like birth control. If you only have your ovaries or you have neither, then you can only have an estrogen-based. They don't give you that pro progesterone as well. And those can come in different forms. We can come have pills that can go oral and will affect your whole body, skin patches that can affect your whole body. There are gels that can be applied topically, like to the vaginal area as needed, and those are gonna work more locally. So if it's something that's gonna affect your whole body, it does come with some bigger side effects. And this is really why in the past decade or so, we have weaned away from hormone replacement as much as we possibly can because the side effects, especially of the systemic medications affecting your whole body, can include cancers. Now, we can't say that there is a direct correlation between estrogen replacement and various types of cancer, but there is a strong connection. And that's usually enough of a scary topic to, to sway most people away. There is a risk potentially. Heart attacks. We know, as I just mentioned earlier, that it affects, it helps our heart, so when we lose it, now I'm going to put it back, it should make my heart better, but, well, it doesn't really, because it's not coming from you, it's coming from outside, and there is some potential associated risk with heart attacks. Again, we can't rule out the fact of age and lifestyle and activity and all of those other factors as well. And then a DVT or a blood clot, so that's a deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot within your leg. We have that increased risk any time that we take hormones, whether that be birth control or uh, hormone replacement after menopause. So those come with that natural side effect all across the lifespan. So some of the systemic things, if you're going to take that pill or use a cream or a patch and it's going to get to your whole body, well, that can relieve any of the symptoms of menopause or maybe a lot of them. But we can also use some of the localized ones, like for vaginal dryness, we can have a hormone that is uh, in a pill, usually it's a pill, but it's inserted into the vaginal canal and it dissolves, just like if you were to put a mint in your mouth and it dissolves, and then it only works right there. It doesn't affect your whole body. So the likelihood of having injuries uh, or having some of those other side effects does go down. Oh, and I'm done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and... So I'm going to pass it off to Elaine. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. But I, 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 I will start by saying I'm going to have to talk to Kristen's mother because when I have to go, it's more like this. I can't walk. Oh, we'll walk so on. we need to work on that. I stop wherever I am and just cross my legs. So <laughs> again, my name is Elaine Whale, and I'm the um, faculty and department chair for health and fitness education. Um, my interest mostly in this is partly my, my role, but also I teach women's health. And I wrote the course, oh God, almost 20 years ago. 
So I teach two sections all the time of women's health. And we cover a lot of what these, my partners here have talked about, um, but it's only you know, in, in a certain module of the course. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to share is I want to cover a little more of, and both of them kind of introduced it nicely in that we want to try to do anything else we can first that's more natural. Or, um, I, you know, that word, but you know what I mean if I say natural before we go to estrogen replacement, because we, we always have that as a backup if we need it or if we're really having a horrible time. The other thing uh, that I want to mention, in a recent uh, survey, 95% of women said they would rather try an alternative therapy first before hormone replacement therapy because they're worried about the risks. So the, the, the data is out there that they would like to try it, um, and they may not be successful, but at least they are willing to try it. And, and I, I do recommend always working with your physician or uh, uh, it could be a physical therapy therapist, it could be um, a physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, you get my drift, right? So I'm mostly going to talk about exercise, uh, nutrition, and then I want to talk a little bit about CAMS. For those of you who don't, want, don't know what CAMS are, it's complementary and alternative medicine. And there are some really good... Um, um, adjuncts that you can use for these. And I think it was uh, Christine who mentioned earlier, it's really hard in her one slide to find data that supports other things, like this particular one. But it I can't tell you how much digging. It's called Complementary and Alternative Therapies. And it was a really good source. It's from a, um, Great Britain, the, their counterpart to the North American Menopause Society in this NAMS in this, in this country. But you have to dig and dig and dig, and it's really hard to find alternative or complementary things um, in the traditional ones because they're being cautious. They're always saying, see your physician first. Well, your physician's most likely not going to know about a lot of like things like acupuncture, you know, things like that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about exercise first, and I have a couple quotes here for you, but... Um, and I think you all know by now osteoporosis, but I, and I put it here to check with your physician first before you do exercise, partly because you don't know if you have it or, well, you, you, you might know, but you, if you don't know, it's always good to have, um, to find out what level of bone density you have. And, and I talked to Joel Chapman, who I have his name on one of the slides. He's the director of our fitness center. And if you are a woman of 55 or older, you have to have a doctor sign a, per a permit to work out there because they want to make sure um, it's not just liability. They just want to make sure your heart and your bones are, you know, okay. Um, if you're a man, then you have to be 45. 45 and older, you have to because they have a higher rate of heart attacks. Um, so I put a very simple definition is a condition in which there is a decrease in the amount and thickness of bone tissue. I think Kristen went into way more detail, which is really nice because she gave some examples of the different level, levels. So, but the advantage, the biggest big picture of exercise really can do these four things. It really can lower your fracture risk, strengthen your bone, bones and muscles. Um, you can actually, and she said, you can, you grow bone. People don't realize bone is living tissue. You replace it all the time. Um, exercise also helps with balance and coordination and um, range of motion and flexibility. And, uh, and we talk a lot about bone density. We forget about um, um, balance and coordination is so important. And I always ask my students in my, in my, both my class, my nutrition classes and women's health, and I, I, em, I emulate this position. You know, you know, what am I doing, Kristen? But what am I, when you get older, we lose this motion a lot of times because we don't have balance and we don't have strength. When do you need, what do you, you lose a lot of independence when you can't do this. Peeing, I figured, I figured you'd get, it. huh? <laughs> so it's going to the bathroom. If you can't squat to get up and down off a toilet, it's one of the first things that goes where people are, lose their independence. And they really don't like that, right? So that's very frustrating. So exercise can help you keep that balance and coordination. Um, when, I, when I teach the women's health class face-to-face, -face, and it has been a few years that I've done that, um, I have them practice in class, like picking up a leg. A lot of people can't pick up one leg and balance. I have heels on, so I'm not going to. But um, Or close your eyes and try it. Uh, if you do it at home, make sure you have something next door to you so you can, you know. But it's really hard. And, but it, you, it gets easier. It really gets easier as you practice it. And flexibility. Flexibility and range of motion is really like touching your toes, right? Um, 
So that, you know, the more you do that, you can also get better at that also. Okay, so weight-bearing exercises. And this is where I, t I spoke to Joel as the, in the fitness center. He has a master's degree in kinesiology, exercise science, and he, um, a CSES, which stands for Certified Strength and Conditioning Coach, um, which is um, really high, specialist, specialist. So anyway, he, he talked about, he gave me some examples of particularly particular types of exercise. And walking is the one we talk about a lot because he said walking is one of those things that could be high impact and it could be low impact. It could be very gentle walking. You go casually walk your dog, right? Or you can power walk. Power walk is much more of, any, of a um, higher impact. So walking is one, I have it here under low impact, but it really can vary. But your higher impact um, exercises would be running, jogging, jumping rope, racket sports like tennis. Uh, body weight exercises and like lunges, squats, and step ups. Moderate would be climbing stairs, dancing, hiking, and in low impact, elliptical. And elliptical is controversial because elliptical is not really uh, weight bearing, but it can be recommended in initially to kind of loosen things up and get you where you can walk or do some of the other machines, right? Uh, stair step machines and walking are considered more of your low impact, they're not power walking. Okay. Um, okay, I'm I, I'm just habit of saying any questions, but I know you're going to text questions or or save them to the end. Um, normally in my class, I'm like before I change slides, I ask for questions. So I want to talk a little bit about nutrition. Oh, I'm going to give you my quote here first. Um, Joel loves this quote. It's called "Strong Women Stay Young," and it's really based on. He, he said, "I can't really take credit for that quote." It's by Miriam E. Nelson. She's a PhD, and there's a book by that exact title. His favorite quote is, he said, strength will give you the ability to move with balance and coordination. This will result in a longer, more independent life. And that's really, to me, what a lot of this is about, is being able to live longer, not just gracefully, but having strength and power to be an 80 or 90 year old woman taking care of themselves and being able to move. Okay, all right. So nutrition is really my forte, other than women's health. And I love talking about nutrition. I teach uh, three or four sections a semester. And I did bring in two books, uh, partly because people ask me all the time if, to recommend a book. My students read this book called Low Fat Lies. High Fat, oh, excuse me, it's my, I'm not used to having a, a device on. Low Fat Lies, High Fat Fraud. Uh, I'll put it right here if anyone wants to take a look at it. And I also brought in, which is really about the Mediterranean lifestyle, and I have a, a, a cookbook here, the Mediterranean Diet Cookbook for Beginners. Really nice, um, great recipes. I've tried half a dozen of them. So if you would like to take a look, you're more than welcome to just put them back. So I brought those to show you. Um, so um, the best thing in nutrition is to look, and it's hard because as we get older, we do tend to, um, as we lose mobility, we also sometimes, we aren't as active, we don't have as much muscle, and sometimes we gain weight, and we don't like that, but a lot of it is we're so used to eating the same amount of foods or calories for when you were in your 20s, and all of a sudden you're 50 or 60, guess what? You're eating the same calories, because that's just habit, um, but we're not as active as we once were. So it catches up with us, so to speak. Um, so. In foods, specific foods, I always talk about plant foods, because, not just because, and I'm not about a, being a vegetarian, but plant foods are lower in calories, but they are also really rich in antioxidants and phytochemicals. And those things are powerhouses of um, health benefits, right? You don't get them from animals. They're only in plant sources. Um, they're in whole grains, right? But most people think of a grain as a donut. That's about as close as they get to a, you know, a grain. So, um, so plant-based diet does not mean vegetarian, but plant-based means as much plant-based as you can do, and you want to eat the rainbow. You want colors because you, you get different phytochemicals in different colored food. Uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, the, dark, the darker the green, darker the better. Uh, be careful what you buy. It really should be, California has some really good olive oil. Um, Greece and Italy, any of you know the olive tap in Crystal Lake? is a good place to purchase. You gotta be careful, because some companies actually, it, it, it's not real olive oil. They're slapping labels on it. So there are websites you can, you can kind of figure that out. Uh, but olive oil, 
um, and omega-3 fatty acid sources. The best source that I know of is fish, right? Um, and I joke around that living in the Midwest now, I'm a Midwesterner, but I'm from the East Coast where we ate fresh fish every week. I moved out here and it was fish fry Friday nights in the basement of a church. I was like, big difference, right? So, but fish is the absolute best way to get your omega-3s. You can get some in walnuts and flax seeds, but it doesn't convert um, as readily to the, the omega that you need in the brain for brain health. So eat some fish if you, hopefully you like fish. Um, diets low in processed foods and sugar. So processed means anything that has a label on it. When you go down the meat aisle or the dairy aisle, most, not all dairy, but, um, or fruits and vegetables, you don't see a label, right? Because they're not processed, right? So things that are uh, processed foods, you're going to have more, um, more, more carbohydrates, less whole grains perhaps, certainly less antioxidants, and phytochemicals, right? Um, cookies and pastries, that's a, that's a big one. You know, I talk about that a lot with my students. We don't, they don't like to talk about things like that, but we do because we love our sweets, right? And it, it should really be less than 10% of your calories. And most of the time when, when they do their diet analysis, they're consuming 25 to 50% of their calories come from sweets, right? So. Um, fast food is another big one. Maybe not in, a, in, in, in older people. I, I don't think go to fast food as much, but certainly our students go to fast food sometimes every day, twice a day. It's amazing. Supplements. Um, I do recommend a couple supplements, partly because 98% of people in this country don't get enough vitamins and minerals, even if they try to eat correctly. And, and, I, and I, there's a lot of literature that, that, that show that. Um, the best recommendation that I can find with multiple doctors, um, I, I also double checked with Dr. Oz because Dr. Oz, everybody knows who Dr. Oz is, but he did, con it was very similar to other, other recommendations, was a multivitamin mineral complex split into two doses. And the reason you split it into two doses is so that it's absorbed better. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acid, if you're not eating fish, and you need to eat fish at least two or three times a week, and that's the fatty fish, right? It's not fish fry Friday nights, it doesn't count. Might taste good, but it doesn't count. Um, magnesium and potassium rich foods. I wouldn't get those in pill forms. It's really easy. You just have to eat a whole food. Any whole food has magnesium and potassium in it, not just the banana. I tell my students, think of outside of the banana. They always think of the banana. Uh, vitamin D3. The best way to get vitamin D3 is the sun. Our body makes it the way it's supposed to have it. However, Many dermatologists or regular doctors will want you to slather up the, you know, with the uh, sunblock. Um, I tell my students, don't tell your dermatologist I said this, but get some sun if you can, right? Don't get it at noon where you're going to burn and peel, but if you can go out at 10 a.m. or maybe 4 p.m., the best way to get vitamin D is the sun. It's not in a lot of good foods. I mean, common. I shouldn't say good foods. Common. Eggs, some mushrooms, liver, right? A lot of people don't like liver. It's not, in a, and it's in fortified foods, but I don't like to rely on that because fortified foods is exactly like taking a pill. You might as well take a pill, right? Um, and vitamin E, they're both very necessary for inflammation and um, uh, skin, right? But they're both, even though they're fat soluble, your body stores them, they're very hard. They're, they're just not in a lot of foods, right? Um, I think that's about it on nutrition. All right, my last slide, did I have, I didn't have a quote for you from nutrition, okay? I did have a couple quotes um, from CAMS. So CAMS stands for Complementary and, Me and Alternative Medicine. Um, it, definition for you is medical practices that are not part of standard medical care. And this comes from the, this agency, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And this started probably, oh, at least 10 or 15 years ago. If, you've, if any of you have heard of Dr. Andrew Weil, he started the whole program of integrative medicine probably 20 years ago or more. And he is kind of like my, he's the guy with bald with a long beard. And he's been around, people laughed at him 20 years ago and they, they thought he was a quack. And now he is revered as one of the, the top integrative medicine doctors in the country. So that's where, just so you have a definition, and we, we do, we spend, we spend a fair amount of time on understanding CAMS. Um, so I gave some examples here. Acupuncture is a very common one, and actually has really good um, results for um, menopausal symptoms. 
Um, acupuncture is a technique where practitioners stimulate specific points in the body, usually by inserting needles through the skin. Um, and generally speaking, it's not deep, and they're very thin, and it's it pretty much, I can say, I, I've had it done, it's really pretty painless. Um, chiropractic, or chiropractic, excuse me, is a healthcare profession that focuses on the spine and other joints of the body and their connection to the nervous system. So I have a friend of mine who's a chiropractor, I asked him to give me a quote, and he just said, our bodies need a mechanic like our cars do. He said, I'm just a body mechanic. So I thought that was a very simple way of looking at it. His name is Dr. John Turlop, and he's a Turlop chiropractic here in Crystal Lake. And it's a very simple way of looking at it, right? He, he really feels it's necessary, but he's no more than a good body mechanic. Um, yoga. Here I have a good quote, but yoga, and a, a lot of people know what yoga is, but it combines physical postures and movement, breathing techniques, and meditation or relaxation. So I, have a, I do have a quote here from, we have a yoga instructor here at the college. Her name is Kara Muter, and she, is, um, the, she owns the Yoga Lounge in Woodstock, and she's been practicing and teaching yoga for over 30 years. She says, yoga means to yoke or union. Yoga is a series of techniques creating created more than 2,000 years ago, designed to rebalance the body, mind, and spirit. It is a system of physiological, philosophical, and psychological disciplines, I had to practice that line, that, that integrate breath, movement, gentle stretching, meditation, and mindfulness to improve strength, stability, and flexibility for the body, while bringing increased awareness and equanimity to the mind, resulting in a sense of calm, peace, and acceptance within. What a nice long definition, right? I had to write it down. So um, that, and again, that's from a really a well-known, if any of you know Woodstock or Crystal Lake, you probably know of, her, of the yoga lounge. And she does, I give her a little plug here, she teaches a couple uh, credit classes for us during the day. Okay. Uh, meditation, a lot of people, I, I really promote meditation for my students. They're always telling me, I can't, I don't have time to meditate. I'm like, you only need to meditate five, 10 minutes a day. Five, and there's thousands of apps for your phone today. Don't do it when you're driving, okay? Um, but you'll be surprised, be surprised. A set of techniques that are intended to encourage heightened state of awareness and focused attention. Um, I didn't talk to anybody specifically about that except what Cara had said it kind of includes in her yoga. Homeopathy is a system of medicine that is based in the principle of like cures like with practitioners prescribing diluted substances to stimulate the body to heal. And I did, I have a friend of mine who's a homeopath, I asked her to, if she would further uh, give me a little bit more depth of, of homeopathy. So she said, homeopathy is a gentle, natural healing system that works with the body to relieve symptoms, restore vitality, and improve overall health. It is a federally recognized form of medicine backed by thousands of research papers, studies, and clinical trials. And she's a certified classical homeopath and a, and a clinical homeopath. Um, herbals, a lot of people have heard of different herbs. Black cohosh, wild yams, and ginseng are the three very common ones I, I put down here. And um, it was recommended that you can, certain herbs are recommended with a certain logo because it's been, um, it's got THR on them. And the THR logo stands for Traditional Herbal Medicines. So if you're going to use an herb, it's recommended that you find one with that logo because it's got a lot of studies behind it. Um, what else here? So they're products made from plants used to treat diseases or to maintain health. Um, again, depending on where you look, if you look in, an, in if you can get into a really interesting uh, site like I was able to find for natural remedies, you might be able to find some good data. The data is mixed on it though. Uh, Black Cohash has a really good track record with um, four hot flashes, but it also has other risks. If you're taking other medications, you have to be really careful. Same thing with uh, St. John's Wort. Uh, St. John's Wort has got really good reviews for uh, hot flashes, but if you're, you really shouldn't be taking any other pres prescriptions, okay? Um, special diets, I talked a little bit about that, but there are special diets uh, that for, for anti-cancer. Sometimes people who ha are dealing with cancer and chemo will um, um, more of a plant-based vegetarian diet is really recommended for uh, cancer patients. Mediterranean and low carb. Epilepsy, believe it or not, there's a, it's, it's really like the keto, the keto, the true keto, because most people who do keto do more like an Atkins diet. The true keto was developed way long time ago in the 30s and 40s and 50s for children who had epilepsy, very high fat. 
because your brain is a lot of fat, right? So the, the high fat diets really did help their seizures. And I think the last one I have in here is hypnosis, um, which also has a really good track record. A person's attention is concentrated and focused, thus having a more heightened responsiveness to verbal messages. And that's, that's it for what I have on my three. I got a couple through the app, but does anyone want to ask one out loud? <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything you want. You want to hear what people wrote in the app? Okay, so the first question I got was how much control do we have over what happens during menopause and in what areas? You want to start with that one? Sure. Um, so you, you don't have a lot. Sorry. Outside of the emotional aspect of it, you can you can control your your well-being, and you can take that. But when it comes to the physiologic side of it, you can control weight and activity, and right. those things tend to. If you're really if you're doing a lot of vigorous aerobic exercises or those weight-bearing ones that that Elaine pointed out, you tend to be tired, and then you sleep better. So then your sleep can improve. So you can take a little bit of a roundabout to improve those things, but when it comes to actually changing what is physiologically happening within your body, we don't have a lot of control. Right. The reason that it only lasts about four to eight years of the main, and that sounds really big, like eight years yeah. sounds massive yeah, to me, <laughs> um, and, but that, that's the generals, right? Some women are as little as 20 to 30 days of symptoms, and the bone loss though can go up to those eight years. But most of the other symptoms, your body figures out how to regulate those with right, the hot right. flashes and the night sweats and, and the sleep disorders pretty quickly. And most women can kind of figure out their bodies internally, figure out how to control those much faster. Right. Yeah. So, um, and just to clarify also in terms of those symptoms, like obviously with the decrease in estrogen levels, there's nothing that you can really do in terms of elastin and collagen nope. and bone loss. Right. Um, but despite what cosmetic companies want you to think. <laughs> right. But the rest of it, there's a lot of variation. So as I started off talking about people's attitudes, you know, focusing on what's good. So going back to some of the things you were mentioning in terms of meditation and mindfulness and being present, to not focus on all of the problems in life and that new wrinkle that you've got on your face, and instead think about what you've gained um, and what's good about your life. Um, in the psychology department, we, we all love our positive psychology, and so there's a lot of research just on like gratitude journals. So if you just take a moment each day and think about what, what, what went right, um, what are you grateful for in that moment? Um, and so strengthening our, our spirit and our mind um, is so beneficial, and that is beneficial for us biologically, even if it doesn't change you know, right. our fracture risk. But you know, just to add on to that, mm -hmm. what you do mentally really can affect physically. Mm -hmm. It can't change a wrinkle, right? But it can change your attitude and it can change just how you feel day to day. Absolutely. Um, the other question we got is does having an easy painless men or does having an easy painless menstrual cycle help with having easier menopause? Do you I, know anything about I, that? I have seen it both ways. Okay. I, I you know, and I have seen some people say they have horrible menstrual cycles and then have a relatively easy time, and I've heard it flipped. I don't think it's a necessary, a guarantee. I will say that sometimes, uh, just like menstrual cycles, sometimes get better after childbirth. Um, I, 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 you know, that they, 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 there's, you can, you can find literature about that. I, I same thing with, with menopause. I think it depends on the individual, but I uh, probably of the three of us, I'm the oldest one here. <laughs> You know, I, I sailed right through it. I had minimal, minimal symptoms, hot flashes. That's all I had. Annoying, but. When it comes to really painful menstruations, um, kind of flipping that question yeah. on the opposite side, um, that can come with a bunch of other symptoms and conditions and disorders that can make menopause more challenging. Right. Um, and you might have more symptoms when it comes to mainly the pelvic symptoms that we're gonna have, not necessarily the hot flashes and, and night sweats. Um, but so that can, but I have not heard any research or read any right. research that says having light menstruation makes an easier yeah. mm -hmm. uh, transition. I, I can't speak to that one, but I can the opposite side. It can make it a smidge more challenging. Yeah.
but you'll look forward to it more. Oh, wouldn't you though? <laughs> Those were our questions in the app. I don't think we've got any more. Any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. About what? Hair. Gray, you mean gray? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, I know, you know, hair texture changes a little bit as we get older, as it grays, because mm -hmm. the gray hair itself it's is a coarser, hair. drier mm -hmm. hair. Um, I, I, you know, I used to have to wash my hair every day, you know. Mm -hmm. I only wash my hair twice a week now. But I think it also is good for it to not be washed so frequently, right? Because mm -hmm. if you touch my hair, it's very soft. <laughs> it doesn't feel any different, you know. So there is a, so the texture does change, but, mm -hmm. and gray. We can't do much about gray. And it can thin. Um, there can yeah, be some thinning. Yeah, some people thin. Loss. I'm lucky it, that mm -hmm. hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had hair like that. I'm not blessed. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to growing hair in other places, though, you know, that we may not have had oh, to yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. affect, um, that does come with a decrease in estrogen as well. As we lose those hormones, mm -hmm. um, the body kind of starts to produce things it, it different. Well, you've seen jokes about you lose hair yeah. up here and you gain hair like. <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother, I, used to, I remember sitting next to my grandmother and wanting to know why she had a couple whiskers. And my grandma, why, I was only like 10 or 12, I'm like, why don't you just pull those out? And she's like, she didn't care, right? She didn't care. But you're right, I forgot. We should all be like your grandma. Yeah. Just not care yeah, about just it. Just don't care. She did not care. Love what you got. And my grandfather didn't care either. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good question, okay. though. Yeah. Right. If you can solve it, I think you can make millions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Yeah. Yeah. So now, we didn't specifically. I, but I we, didn't because it's we super do. depressing. We both of us do in our class. And I. But, I thought it was. I, I talked enough about depressing things, and I didn't yeah. want this to be a sad talk. Um, well, so perimenopause can actually start in the mid thirties yeah. mm -hmm. and the body starts to have fluctuations in hormones then and can last yeah. 10 to 15 years until mm -hmm. you actually enter menopause. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that perimenopausal stage can be really long. Um, and that's where we start to notice things like the decrease <coughs> in the elastin and the collagen within our, we usually see it, you know, in our, our more superficial skins first. Um, but it happens on all body tissues at the same time. It's, it's why you don't see, uh, and, and grandpas as well, but you know, those older grandmas and grandpas with big, strong muscles, because as we start to lose those natural hormones, women, estrogen, men, testosterone, our muscles do tend to thin and get like, like more stringy, as, as not nice as that sounds. Um, but that can start earlier, but you can undo a lot of those by just simple physical activity. Yeah. And you can always, and people don't realize this, you can always build muscle. Yeah. You, as long as you are above ground, you can build muscle. I was so it's never too late to start yeah. weight training and building up those muscles to counteract some of those perimenopausal symptoms yeah. that usually have nothing to do with hot flashes, but it might be weight gain, yeah. um, fatigue, uh, decrease in muscle mass, increase in adipose tissue, or just surface layer fat Sh tissues, body and then those lovely wrinkles. Right, right. I have to tell you, I was in the fitness center earlier. If you want to, you want to really feel young and good, go to the fitness center because there's so many people in there that are older working out and they have muscles. I'm like, wow. And this one lady was on the machine. I like the rowing machine because you, you use your legs and you pull, you know. Mm -hmm. And Joel just said to me, he goes, do you know she's 81 years old? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, see, when I'm 81, I want to be doing that, right? <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there. Just, just tonight, she, that, that was tonight. So she did not look 81. <laughs> you know, it, it, it goes to show that it really depends on your, your mindset and your, mm -hmm. your wants, your drive to be young. Because as patients, I've had really old, old 50-year-olds and really young 90-year-olds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the age is, is, is yes. as yeah. silly as it sounds. It really is just a number. You can make it what you want to make it. 
And, and don't, I think don't be afraid of muscles. I, I see this all the time. So does Joel. Women are thinking they're afraid of having some muscle on their body that they're going to bulk up. It just, we don't have enough testosterone to bulk up. But you need muscle as we get older because it helps with all that other balance, strength, everything. Yeah. And I'm totally going to jump off of my ship and onto Christine's for a second, because this is out of my realm. Um, but I actually read a study that was looking at the differences in sleep medications compared to meditation. And you could increase, and I'm going to have my numbers wrong, but it was something like around 12 to 15 minutes of sleep earlier with a medication and about nine with medica meditation. Yeah. So it's practically the same. So Three you know, minutes, And there's yeah. no side effects to meditation. Mm -hmm. Or deep breathing, deep breathing. There's a multi, you could just look up deep breathing exercise. Dr. Andrew Weil has a, an exceptional one we use in the stress management class here. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, but there's two really famous ones. But mm -hmm. just doing that for a couple minutes before bed is, is it like a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. But it, this lowers your blood pressure and lowers your heart rate, everything, and you, you go to sleep much faster. Right. And just to tie back to what Magdalena was saying, like our focus tonight has been on menopause, obviously. Um, but all of these things are beneficial techniques, you know, throughout life, um, and they help with our brain health, they help with our body health, um, and that's what we all really want. Like, you know, the menstrual cycle, sure, it's important, um, but what we all want is to be healthy and happy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so good diet, good exercise, good mental health practices, um, that's what it's all about. Yep. So our final slide, I think, was just closing remarks. And I wanted to end, in case you hadn't seen this for a while, um, the Super Bowl in 2020 was Jennifer Lopez pole 50, dancing 50, at 50 age 50. Years old. <laughs> so, you know, we can all start that next. <laughs> <laughs> now granted, she never lost it, or she, you know, but, but the fact that she continued and right. was, has the body of a, you know, 12 year old. But. Exactly. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yes.